Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hi, everybody. How are you? Good to see you. How's things? Let's see here. Are we properly logged in? Looks like we're here. Can I leave comments? Okay. Good morning from Ber oh, Berlin. Sandra, good to see you. How are you? How are you? How's my, how are my friends? Give me one second. I think I'm, I need to log into the other machine. I just realized I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong, uh, 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 you know, session. Let's see here. Oh, computers. Okay. It thinks I'm me. So why is it having trouble? Showing me a useful version of the screen. Let's see. Okay. How bizarre. Why can't I? Oh, I can. Oh, that's so terrible. Hello. Hello from, from, <laughs> let me think. Okay, so let me see. Um, good morning from Berlin. Yes. I don't know any. German. I know like, you know, I'm a jelly donut. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I wish I could. Sandra, you got to teach me some German so I can like say hi. Guten Tag. Is that still a thing? Is that right? I'm, in, I'm not even sure if that's even correct. But uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Hello. Good night from China. China. Oh, so good to see you. Welcome. Welcome to the, uh, to the show. Uh, let me think. China is, well, Ni Hao is China. Like it's, it's hello, but Ni Hao Chong, uh, George and Shao, right? Hello from San Francisco. Uh, let's see, nice weather. Yeah, well, oh, weather is is better today. Yeah, the weather's much better. So, so much better. Yesterday, <laughs> it was uh, a nightmare. Yesterday, I don't even know what was going on. Um, oh, Paris is there too. Salut depuis uh, San Francisco. Hello from Singapore. Oh, hi, I love Singapore. I love China, I love Singapore. Uh, 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 Paris, I love Morocco, I love China, I love every place I'm seeing. Berlin, I love Berlin. Yeah, you had snow, which is okay because you know how to deal with snow, right? Your city was built with the expectation that someday it might snow because that's a thing it does there. Yesterday, we had wind. I don't know if you can see. How do I show you? Can you see? Let's see, let's see. Right, like there are condo buildings. There's skyscrapers over there, right? And yesterday, oh dear, okay, it's out. Yesterday we we had wind. Uh, you know what a lawn chair is, like a, a like a chair. Uh, Kazakhstan, hi, good to good to see you. Hi from Dubai, hello Siberia, Dubai, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, London, <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Uh, salut desde uh, uh, the, the San Francisco, nice to see you. Um, uh, snow, I love snow. Hello from Singapore, Paris, uh, bonjour again, Morocco, bonjour. Hello from China. I just love this. This is great. Welcome, everybody. Um, but anyway, we had Siberia. Whoa. Wow. And Dubai, I love. And Siberia, I love. I'm so happy you're here. Um, we had weather yesterday where people have, you know, there, there's these other buildings. There's a building right across the street from me. There's all these huge buildings. And we, you know, I'm not on the highest floor by any stretch. I'm just on the, the you know, the teens. Um, hello from the Philippines. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Um, but uh, we had we had people, we had so much wind that the chairs from people's balconies were being blown out of their balconies and into the air. And so a chair fell from a skyscraper over there. I could see it from my living room, which is, you know, 10 meters that way, I saw a chair fall from a building and land right next to a car. Nobody was hurt. Nobody's, nobody was hurt, but but still, <laughs> what the, eh, you know, like very, very scary weather. It was crazy. It sounded like, um, uh, uh, I don't like a jet engine because you could hear the whistling. You could hear the wind whistling past all the doors and the corridors of the, uh, of the city. Oh, crazy. So today, yeah, beautiful weather, beautiful. And I can see the sun. But most importantly, I don't see wind. It was it rained a lot yesterday morning, uh, but today, my goodness, you know, 
Okay, my friends, we have so much to cover, so much to cover. So let me just dive right into it. Uh, we are going to talk about some of the stuff that I was thinking about as I was writing the uh, uh, deck chair. Yes, a use case for Kafka and IoT. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we can use Kafka and IoT to make coffee. I mean, there's, you can do almost anything with a, uh, you know, you know, Pi for J, um, which is a library for using Raspberry Pi from Java, right? From from uh, You have some doubts in Spring Boot. And you called me sir. Don't call me sir. I'm just Josh. Nice to meet you. What are your questions, my friend? Just drop them here in the chat, and we'll we'll have a conversation. Um, okay, so let's see here. Uh, there we go. All right, so you can see my screen, I trust. So, um, so yeah, there's a, a library called pi for j which is a great library for manipulating uh, Raspberry Pis, and you can use it from Java. So Phil Webb and I, you know, about a decade ago, Phil Webb is the co-founder of Spring Boot, and he's a friend, and, you know, we, um, we built a demo where you could use Spring Boot, uh, the actuator, the endpoints in the Spring Boot application to signal the alarm when something is going wrong, those endpoints are very useful. You can monitor them. So we built an example where, <laughs> as a demo, we used a, a Pi for, we had a little process running on a Raspberry Pi, and that process would just periodically pull the actuator endpoints. And whenever the actuator endpoints for our service returned a, a, a bad status code, you know, non-200, uh, we used, we'd use Raspberry Pi to basically start the circuit so that the coffee machine to which our Raspberry Pi was connected would start making coffee because the thinking was, uh, if something is wrong, you're gonna need some coffee, right? Somebody's gonna be awake trying to resolve a production outage and uh, somebody's gonna need some coffee. So I, yeah, coffee, uh, yeah, IoT for the win. And I, uh, it, was a, it was a bit overkill, but yeah, we could have used Kafka there too. We definitely could have. Oh, okay, so speaking of coffee, here we are. You know, I, I named the channel Coffee and Software because like, you know, Java, right? I love Java, I love coffee, I love the JVM. It just, <clears throat> uh, it just so happens, however, that uh, a lot of these live streams have just been in the morning around the time I drink my coffee. And that has just been a lovely coincidence, but, but uh, I like it. Let's just, you know, we'll, we'll take credit for it. Let's just say that's what I was intending. And, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, don't, if, anybody, if anybody asks, that's what we'll report. Okay, friends. So we're going to do a, a we're going to backtrack a little bit. Today, I want to cover coroutines. This is the perennial uh, sort of goal of every episode is to get to coroutines and spring boot. But I keep pushing it back because I keep thinking of things I need to cover. And I want to make sure we do a good job. So we're going to talk about coroutines today. I know you've heard this before, uh, but I have a couple of things I want to talk about first, namely uh, delegates and operator overloading and, um, you know, uh, that kind of stuff and destructuring. Okay, so let's just build a, a simple app. Uh, so simple uh, and then whatever, like uh, boot default, Kotlin. Oh, wait, no, actually, I'll just call this simple Kotlin. This is not even Spring Boot, really. So we're going to use Kotlin and Gradle. We we'll use Kotlin the language. And for now, since we're not doing reactive just yet, I'll hit enter. Okay. We'll open this up in the IDE. Ooh. Okay. Open that up. Yeah. All righty. So let's open this up. Hola, hello from Spain. Hi, good to see you. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Okay, friends. So a couple things, just uh, just small stuff, so we can have this in our in our repertoire, so that you can say you learned about it because it is important, but it's not like it's not going to take a long time to learn it. A couple things. Okay, there's a, there's a lot of conventions in Kotlin the language that. Uh, as somebody who uses it, I already kind of knew, and I just kind of took it for granted, and I was thinking about it the other day. And uh, yeah, we need to like cover those. Those are not things that are bound by a particular interface either, right? Uh, in Java, the only thing I can think of that is conventional, right, as opposed to, um, uh, um, you know, driven by a type uh, hint of some sort or an annotation uh, is serialization. You can use implement serializable, right? Um, but uh, I guess that's actually a type hint too, actually. 
you know, that, that's basically it, right? Like that's the, even that, you know, I don't think really we'd even have conventions in Java. There, there are certain methods that you have to override from Java lagging object in order to do things. Like if you want to do a two string, uh, you have to override the method, but it's kind of obvious you, you overload, you override a method, right? It's in the language itself. In Kotlin, there are a lot of things that the language will do for you like Python or like other, you know, loosely typed languages that are just based on convention, that are just based on what you've typed, not so much any contract that you've implemented or satisfied or whatever. Um, and so uh, I guess the, I guess we start from the, the biggest example, right? Um, operator overloading. This is one of those things where I think a lot of people don't really like uh, appreciate <laughs> the, the possibilities. Um, we talked about it earlier, right? We like if I say val map equals map of, and I just say uh, a to one. Okay, so I'm come on, I'm new keyboard still. I'm still making progress, and here's another one. I'm doing b to two, whatever. Okay, so now I've got a map, and it's got string keys and uh, integers. And by the way, that's a nice syntax. I forgot about mentioning this. This is it creates like a pair, basically, right? Um, and this pair is what the map keeps underneath the hood. So it's a nice way to say, I'm going to create a map with keys and values of the, of, of this sort. Um, okay. So I have a map. Um, I can, did you know I can index into this map? Like, like this, right? And I think I even talked, I think we even started to talk about this at one point, uh, but I never really kind of looped back and talked about it. So first of all, yeah, you can index into maps, right? And the, and the reason you can do that. It's because if you look at this, there's an there's an operator, public operator fun get key and value. Okay, you can do that yourself. So if you have a person, and we saw this yesterday when we did the result set for the exposed ORM, right? We we saw that we could uh, do that as well. Um, okay, um, good. So so if I have a per so basically, you saw that definition, right? Um, public public fun operator, right? That definition was public operator fun, but I think it's, I think it works either way. Uh, and then this one was called get. And, you know, if you provide a, the key, um, do I have to do this before? Can I do that after? Oops. Oh, get rid of that. Okay. So, and then this returned a, String, okay. public operator key, and this could be, let's say, string, right, whatever. Um, and then I'm going to return an int, okay? So this will be that definition there. And in this case, this is kind of silly, but, you know, I could just return something in the map, for example, which is, uh, again, not all that interesting, but you get the idea, right? So uh, let's see, what does that give me? This is, oh, it's gotta be nullable. Okay, fine. There you go. So all I'm doing there is I'm, I've got a person type. Now we can say val person equals person. Uh, and I can ask it, I can say person dot a, and I can print out that value by dereferencing the key value. Now, of course, you know, I could just create a field, that'd be easy enough, but it's just, really cool that you can kind of do that thing. Oh, uh, it's because I deleted the main class. There you go. So one, one. Okay. So I'm printing it out here and I'm dereferencing it here. So this is an example of operator overloading. There's a lot of them. Um, you can do add, right? We can add one thing to another. Uh, so in, in fact, let's just, I'm not even going to bother with the Kotlin operator overloading example, right? There's just a number of different operator overloads and they're based on the names of the methods. So you can create methods like Unary, unary plus, unary minus, not. You can do methods like ink and dec. Um, you can do methods like a plus b, a minus b, a times b, a divided by b, right? And you're, you know, obviously in these cases, you're going to need to return, you know, a new version of the same type. Uh, or if it makes sense, you could actually return um, a different domain model, right? So like, uh, let's say I have all that and I have a, uh, data class line item, okay? And then this is gonna have a uh, val, you know, skew 
string, okay, and then data class, no, data class um, part, and this will have line items, uh, an array of line items, right? So there's that. Uh, val uh, line items. Line, oh, this keyboard, I swear, sometimes the keyboard and I are just cruising. We're just moving real quick. It's great. Sometimes it's not. What is wrong with this? It's recommended to override property with array type and a data class. True. Let's just do a list. Is that going to work more properly? There you go. Um, okay, so I've got now a list. I've got a cart. I want to I override what it means to add a line item to that. So I'm going to say uh, uh, operator operator oh, oh God. cart dot add li line item uh, returning a new cart okay um, what is the issue with this inapplicable on this function oh plus okay at least the compiler is giving me a little bit of help here there you go plus so now I can Given the line item, I can add this to the cart. I can say, okay, val new cart, you know, nc equals cart. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll take the existing line items. I'll say this dot line items dot, uh, you know, I'll take those. Can I add? I don't know if I can add this uh, list, but it's not a mutable, it's not a mutable list. So I'd have to declare that as such. I could say, well, actually better yet, just make it the same. So I can say val uh, new items equals um, list of, you know, uh, let's think about this. Let's just use mutable. I guess it's probably better just to do the right thing here, the obvious thing and make this a mutable list, right? So there you go, mutable list. And I can actually just take uh, this dot line items dot add li, right? And then pass that in here. So this dot line items, and then return that to so return new cart. Okay, uh, I guess I can just keep that there. Get rid of that. Okay, so return. There you go. So now I can actually just use these uh, these extension functions and this operator that I've added to the uh, line item to the cart. I mean, so val cart equals cart. Okay, and I can say cart. Um, no, this is not what I want to do. I want to do. Uh, I don't know if that works automatically. Will that work for um, plus increment end? I want to do the plus equals. This one, plus assign. So plus equals is what I want, right? So let's say this is this, plus equals. There you go. And then cart, um, you know, mutable list of whatever, it's fine equals a uh, line item, whatever. Okay, so what is the issue with this? None of the, uh, okay, plus equals, oh, plus a sign, okay. Plus, this is, uh, I guess the IDE will give you help here, but it's not giving me enough help that I know what I'm doing. Must return a unit, okay, well, that makes sense. So I guess all we can do there is just add it. Then even that works though, right? So there I'm adding line items. So now if I print out, uh, you know, print line um, cart dot line items, what does that give me? There you go. So and if I do that again, right, two, etc. So you can see, very convenient, right? You can easily add these functions. I did it as an extension function because I'm using a data class. Um, but you could do that yourself. You could just add it to any any uh, object itself. Very convenient. You can see that you get some, yeah, thanks, plus becomes plus assign. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, oh, that's a good point, you know, Marcus, great, very good point. It doesn't work with chaining of optionals. Um, with, uh, with like in TypeScript, and that's true. I didn't even think about that. Uh, if that's that seems like it would be a lost opportunity. 
<sighs> okay, so we, you know, there's there's function, there's operator overloads. Some people will hiss and 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 uh, moan and all that about this. I think it's a great thing. Operators are awesome. The reason that they have such a stigma in the Java community is because of the implied problems of memory management in C++, uh, garbage collection, pointer arithmetic, that kind of stuff. What happens when you move a, a reference over here? Who contains, who owns that reference, right? Um, in, in Java and in garbage collector languages, you just don't have that problem. So you get all the benefits of operator overloading, which is to say much more intuitive APIs um, without, and by the way, yeah, that's a good point too. This could be mutable. There you go. So now I don't even have to have this. I get a default value. You can have all the benefits of um, of, op of operators, which is like a more expressive API without any of the drawbacks, right? It's it's more intuitive. It makes your domain model more approachable and it just equalizes things, right? It shouldn't just be string that has all the fun. You could totally take part of that as well. Chain can only be with question mark get foo question. I don't, let me think. So I guess so. I don't know. Um, yeah, well, anyway, good stuff. So that's that's one thing I wanted to make sure we talked about, right, was uh, uh, operator overloading. The reason you need to know about this is because there are several different things in the language that are just based on the name of the function uh, in place, and in this case, operator. And, um, you know, if you're just running in, in uh, uh, you know, like in Java, you'd, you'd expect uh, an interface or a base method or something like that. It's just... It just doesn't happen that often, okay? Um, okay, so operator overloading is great. And we used um, we used data classes here, okay? Um, let's say we have a data class here for the carp and the username is a string uh, and uh, it has to be specified as well. So we have two fields there. So this is gonna be the cart or a long, okay? So now here's another thing you can do that's kind of based on your convention, which is print line. Oh, no, sorry, I can do val username and then line items, okay? And that equals uh, cart. I can destructure data classes, right? This is something that they've got in other languages like uh, like Python and, and, and uh, TypeScript and so on. So I can say, I can say Username, line items, or, you know, username equals username, right? And line items equals line items, okay? Rerun that. And you can see I'm able to get access to individual constituent fields. Well, this is a magic trick that data classes do for you, but it's something you can also have in your code as well. And it's just based on another convention, which is something called a component, right? So let's say I wanted to create a complex type that isn't a data class. So um, I don't know, customer, okay. And <clears throat> I have private val, again, you know, I can actually, I can still use constructors here. So uh, uh, private val name string. By the way, that's another thing I'm not sure if we talked about that. If you have constructor arguments that you want assigned storage space, you can prefix the constructor parameter with val or var, and that'll make it a, uh, it'll, it'll create a storage, it'll create storage and it'll make it, uh, you know, final or not final. If you want it to be publicly visible, just leave it as is. If you want it to be private, you make sure you prefix it with private. Um, so it won't be, a, there won't be a public getter, et cetera. So uh, um, let's see, uh, age, int, okay, whatever. So I've got these two fields now. I want somebody to be able to read these fields I want them to be able to destructure these important things. Uh, and you can do that by creating an operator. So fun uh, is, a, let me see, operator fun component one equals this dot, this dot name, okay? Operator fun component two equals this dot age, all right? So now we've got this like, whatever, it's a silly example, but you can, you can kind of see where we're going here, right? Customer equals customer, um, Josh 39, and I can now val uh, name age, right? Destructure that into its constituent components. Customer, okay? Print the age is 
Abe and the name is name. Okay, here we go. So there you go. You can see I can destructure. I can write custom destructuring and support. And it, you, you can just keep going. You can have component 5 million if you wanted to, right? Um, it's just very, very convenient. It's just one of those things where if you know if you know the name of the method, you can you can play the game, right? Um, but if not, there's no clue. There's it's just sort of based on convention. You just really have to read the documentation for a lot of stuff. And uh, same thing for operators, right? There's this operator syntax, but the operator keyword doesn't exactly tell you much about what's where it's applicable. You have to just sort of like read everything. And there's a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff in the uh, in the language, right? I, I showed you. Uh, Oh, by the way, <laughs> remember, I've got two fields here, right? Well, I need to destructure all the different components, you know, but I don't necessarily need to use all of them. So if I don't want the name, if I'm just completely uninterested in the name, I can just use underscore, right? So here I'm saying to Kotlin, just give me the age. I don't care about the first one. Okay, let's see. So, okay, good, I'm glad we got that out of the way. Oh, okay, so another thing, we've got properties here. I've been talking about uh, properties and, and all that kind of stuff. Well, let me see, let's go down here, keep moving on, keep moving on down the code page. All right, let's see. Um, there are properties. This is another one of those things where yeah, the language just knows what to do. So let's say, I, I mentioned that you can have a field in the constructor. You can assign storage for, for a parameter in a constructor. Um, and that storage is internal, initialized based on whether you have val or var. And you can even have a public getter or setter um, if you decide to not prefix it with a visibility modifier like public. OK, great. Or I mean private, right? So it's public by default. It's weird. Classes are sealed by default, and um, variables are public by default. Uh, okay. There's if you want to have setters and getters and all that kind of stuff, if you want to have properties, right? There is explicit support for that. And so, let's say uh, I have a name, it's a string, and I want to provide a getter and a setter, right? So um, I want a, I can't do that. It's gotta be a string. So get string pose. What's the issue here, friend? You, oh, use equals? No, that's not. It's a name. Get this. Is it just that it doesn't like the uh, syntax there? What did I do wrong here? Let me think about this. So class foo private val uh, name string get that's fine. Why is that fine? Oh, okay. So is it only inside of a class that it's possible? That's interesting. I've never hit that use case before. Okay, so you can have properties. They they have to be inside of a class apparently, which makes sense, I suppose. So and then uh, if I want it to be mutable, it's not mutable right now. But if I want it to be mutable, uh, new value string, uh, and then you know you can do something here, right? So print line uh, setting name to new value, right, uh, old value, OK? So if I want to print this out, let's say, uh, in the, I don't know, what do I use? I can just make this a variable so it's visible. And then init, okay, so I've got this value. Actually, it doesn't matter if it's private there. I can initialize it. I can print it out. I can interact with it, OK? So print line. Um, the name is name, name equals mob. Now, in this case, I didn't actually update the storage, right? There's no, 
uh, I didn't set the value to anything. I wonder if that works. Can I just do this? Uh, no, not really. You have to be a little sm this dot. You have to do. You have to be a little bit smarter about. Uh, sorry, what is the convention there? Name equals new value. Does that work? Recursive. Yeah, we replace with field. Oh, there you go. Field. That's the magic keyword because I don't do this very often, right? You you can, but a lot of times I just have constructors. I don't have getters and setters. And if I have a getter, uh, then it's just the immutable field anyway, so it doesn't really matter, right? So there you go. That's how you would set. And this is they have this in C sharp as well. This is one of those things that's just really convenient. So variable must be initialized. Uh, well, I th oh, it's not necessarily initialized. Is that what it's trying to say? Let's say we move this out to another class. Private val add initializer. There you go. Okay, so it's got. <laughs> I'm initializing it to nothing. It's going to return either this value or I'm going to update the value here. So then we can we can restore the init function and print all that stuff out. Good and good and good. Okay, print line the name equals blah Bob print line uh, name. Okay, the name now equals name. Okay, restart. Here we go or not. Uh -huh. Of course not. It has to have to initialize this. Oh, okay. Good. Oh my God. Please let me hit that keyboard correctly next time. Okay. So uh, what did I do? Name equals Bob, new value, field equals new value. Saying that, okay, name is equal to old value. That doesn't make sense. Return, oh, it's because it's hard coding that, right? I can, I can return field, there you go. There you go. So you can, the name is nothing. Uh, I'm, I'm then I'm changing it to Bob and I'm then doing that. And you can see I've got setting name to Bob. So it's kind of like AOP. I guess it, you can do a lot of the same things. You can veto things. This is interesting. The fact that you have you can have this nice um, property syntax. But again, um, uh, it, it it can it's fine. I I just don't use this very often, right? Again, it's maybe you do. Maybe maybe you should. I don't have a lot of APIs where I need to control. I don't do setters in Java either, right? I almost never do anymore, right? I might have a getter, and that's that feels weird usually too, right? Usually I don't want to just export state directly. I usually have business methods. Okay, fine. That said, um, a little bit of indirection is nice, right? A little bit of indirection can be really nice. And we talked about that the other day. We talked about something called delegates. Delegates, my friends, are magic, right? Delegates are one of the things that I think sets the language uh, apart because it gives you a mechanism to override and to veto and to observe and to delegate all mutations on, on a variable, okay, on a field. Um, and again, this is about convention. It's just about convention. So let's just take a look at a manual example, okay? Class my delegate thingy, okay? And I wanna, what I'm gonna use, the way you use this is I'm gonna create a variable here, val name um, string by an instance of my delegate thingy. Now this doesn't work yet because I haven't defined the conventional methods, has no method get value and it thus can't serve as a delegate. This is a val, so I need to have a getter. I don't need to have a setter yet, but if I do that, it says I need to have a set and a get value, okay? So I can do that here, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, now, I haven't implemented this yet. It's asking me, it's saying, okay, you want the type to be nothing. I can say this will only work with a string. It's whatever type I want for the receiver, I can do that, right? I can insist, uh, you know, value, whatever. I can insist that this only work on things of a particular type. I could use any, I could use nothing. I mean, there's just all sorts of options there, right? So, now you 
of a string. I am then given access to um, the K property, which I can use to inspect the thing on which I'm making the change, right? Uh, let's see, why is this unhappy with me? Oh, what did it? What happened there? Since when did it require nothing? Is it now a thing you have to have nothing? Has it been that way? Why is it nothing? No, that doesn't make sense. No, see, that doesn't fix it at all. Nothing mutable. So, that doesn't feel right at all. Why would it be like that? Well, okay, okay, whatever. So, um, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Why is this nothing? Why not any, for example? Okay, clearly I have missed a step. That is new, get value. No, no. Um, I, I thought it was any. Yeah, you could use any. Does it have to be that? Does that work? I, you could also type it right to the receiver. Why is this like uh, so confusing right now? Okay, let's Google this because it has been a minute. Um, delegates in Kotlin. Delegation. All right. So. Delegated properties, lazy, blah, blah, blah. There, look. This ref is any. So, but I know you could do, come on. Member, delegate, this, to, okay, whatever. Move on. Property delegate, okay, this ref must be the same type or a super type of the property owner. It should be the type being ex Extended. Operator fun. So is it that I have to have a pointer to wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So what if I did this? I said class uh, delegate container. Well, let's see. So this could be like that. No, that doesn't make sense. It has to be the field you're setting, right? But even there, why doesn't that work? Okay, return int. Now we're cooking. Almost. Okay, there. So I'm not I'm not completely lost. So does that not work in a function? Why wouldn't that work in a function? It does work. Okay, good. So what did I get wrong there the first time? I think the I think the compiler was trying to help. Yeah, um, that's fair. That makes sense. So this is any. Why is it any though? What is that any for? Why does that have to be? That's the object on which I'm making the uh, change, right? So put. Uh, class container, like why pass in the parameter in the first place? So, okay, container is this. Oh, that doesn't it. Interface, uh, value producer, whatever, and then There, that seems better. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 
Okay, so I can actually tell uh, that's conv conv convoluted. Um, okay, good. So now I've got a delegate, again, whose only contract, again, is just the convention. Um, I can tie it to a specific type of field. I'm, in, in this example, I'm saying it's going to return an int, not any. And I'm saying it's only going to accept an int. And I can tie it to a particular receiver. In this case, I'm, I'm saying only instances of value receiver uh, can, can well, how, well, this will work, right? Otherwise, you can use the default. You can use what I had before, which is nothing and any. You can make this value any, and you can have some sort of, you can have generic delegation, okay? Um, <laughs> the reason you would do this is because you want to have, you know, like, aspect-oriented style stuff. Uh, and it's just great for, like, certain design patterns, right? One of the most common of which is delegation, uh, observability, I mean, and also for uh, lazy loading, memoization. And so in the same way that a lot of us use aspect-oriented programming in Spring, uh, but we don't actually have to all that often write our own custom aspects, I hope you don't have to write this stuff. This, this shouldn't happen in your life all that often. Um, so you can just use existing ones. So let's talk about some common existing ones, right? Um, expensive um, um, computation, right? Uh, by lazy. And so lazy, um, change that get value will work with nullable. Is that true? Yeah, I guess, it, wait, so this can return null? It's, it returns an unknown. Wait, I mean, I actually, you know, I could probably just do one. Okay, there you go. So, um, okay, so lazy is a very common one, and I use this all the time. I want to have some sort of computation. Um, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a very good example. That's like an injection point in Spring. I like that. So in this example, you have logger by logger. So you're sitting, you're doing a delegate that will create a field that will create a logger that is uh, scoped to the class that contains the logger, right? Uh, and that's very convenient. So, okay, so here's another one, la lazy computation. So I've got this expensive value. Let's say it's a, a double or something like that, right? Um, And I need to return uh, zero, I guess. Let me see. Lazy must have get value, nothing given. Uh, hmm? Lazy is it the type. Did I just forget that? There, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Create function lazy. Lazy by double, yeah. Um, create, okay, let's see. Initializer. So you're supposed to just return the value, right? Like that's the, it's just, that one's easy. This one I've done in my time. What's the deal? Lazy properties. Yeah, you're supposed to return the value. So. Hello, double by lazy. I guess I don't need to do that. I should just be able to return. Let's just try the canonical example and return a string. Okay, I don't know why that mattered. Uh, let's just try int. Good, okay, there you go. So the idea is that this is a property that will invoke this lambda. I'm, remember, I'm using that, that property where I can call a lambda, I can pass a lambda at, in the parentheses by calling the, the, you know, by, by hanging it outside of the parentheses and omitting the parentheses. But that's what's happening here is I've got this global function in the Kotlin standard library called lazy. It in turn creates a synchronized lazy imp delegate, right? Uh, and then this has, you know, uh, a way to read and write the values um, uh, for you, okay? So delegates are one of those things where as long as you've got a get value and a set value, somewhere, then you can uh, return the value. So all this is doing is it's going to compute this expensive operation, but only when we access the field, okay? So let's say, let's do a thread 
got sleep, okay? So I'm gonna sleep a second and I'm gonna return then the secret of life, okay? So now I can say print line, the value, the expensive computation is expensive computation and I'll print it again. And um, we should see that the first time it takes a second, second time, there you go. The second time was almost instantly. I should have put out the time as well though. You know, you get the idea, right? So uh, system dot actually just instant now. Now. There you go. So you can see uh, 42, 43, and then instantly, right? So this is very convenient, right? I can now lazily arrive at a value. Igor says, lazy works great with Spring when you want, when you, when you, uh, <laughs> when you're too lazy to resolve um, circular dependencies. You just arrived. Welcome to the stream. Hi, welcome. Uh, we are reviewing low level stuff in Kotlin because I feel like I forgot about it earlier on. And I feel like it's worth understanding, even if we're not going to dive too much into it. So we looked at, ever so briefly, we looked at how Kotlin is just full of nice little oddities like um, uh, uh, operator overloading, right? We looked at that. We looked at how you can uh, build um, operators in a custom domain type. We also looked at destructuring, which relies on component convention. So we destructured the cart by its username and line items. That's a magic trick that the uh, data classes give you for you. They give for you uh, automatically. But you can also provide your own destructuring support with component one, component two, uh, you know, ad infinitum, component n. Uh, and you can see that here. We looked at the underscore operator. Then we looked at um, fields, uh, properties. You know, you can have custom uh, get and set properties right there as well. Um, and then we looked at delegation. We're looking at delegation. So basically, you can delegate the computation of a property or the reading of a property to a object or to, to which contains two functions, which are again, based on convention. They're operator fun, get value, operator fun, set value. And what we just learned is that this can be typed to the containing class, the receiver of the property of the uh, that's being delegated. And uh, the, the values for the return value and the S over here have to match. They can be any, which is like Java Lang object. Um, and then we looked at just now, like, you know, a minute ago, we looked at lazy, which is one of the more common delegates that you might find yourself reaching for a lot of a lot of the time. And uh, that's you caught up. I, I think uh, maybe I could have just had all this written out and then we could have started the live stream and I could have just explained all that and that would have, the whole live stream, everything we've done so far would have been one minute, <laughs> but um, whatever, we're here. Okay, so there is one more that you might, one more delegate that you might wanna use. Um, which is delegates.observable, right? So val uh, uh, my observable property equal uh, by delegates dots observable, okay? So oh, look at that, you've got a not null observable, you've got a vetoable observable. Um, so you can like, you can provide the initial value uh, and then provide a lambda that gets called back and you can decide whether you're going to allow that change, which is pretty cool, right? When you think about it, you've got a field that could change based on uh, some rule or not. Maybe you have like a access control decision that you can use to decide, okay, no, I'm not allowing this change. This is not okay. Um, and observable here, you can at least respond to changes, right? So here I'm going to say the initial value is anonymous, right? And then the on change is uh, the k property, the old and the new value. And then I could log stuff out. Okay, so changing k property dot name from old to new. Okay. And uh, why is it so unhappy with me? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so I'm creating an observable. Okay, again, very cute. You know, I, this is the kind of programming that makes the language so much nicer, but, but also can be a little, because remember, 
one of the big reasons you're going to use Kotlin is so that you can write Java without having to write Java. And so this stuff is hard to understand from the Java perspective. If you're looking at bytecode compiled and written using this kind of magic trick and you don't understand Kotlin, a lot of this stuff is going to seem sufficiently magical. But that's OK. It gives you a leg up. Just be aware that you might have to explain some stuff. OK, um, rerun. I didn't, I didn't change it. Um, my observable property equals uh, whatever. Uh, it's a val, so it's not changeable. Var uh, j long. OK. OK, so we changed it from anonymous to JLong. <sighs> oh, that's a good point. You see, I don't do a lot of GUI programming on Android. And uh, you're right. That sounds like a very good point. He's Marcus uh, notes that he used to use observable a lot in user interface coding on Android before coroutines showed up. Very help helpful for doing more, uh, you know, that's a design pattern for UI, for, for user interfaces, but I forget the acronym. Model view, I don't know, something. Um, OK, so good stuff, good stuff. We, we have now completed our uh, quick review of all things uh, cute and magical. Model view, view model. OK, cool. <sighs> OK, let me, um, let's move this off to the side. Any questions on that? Yeah, I think we. Covered all I wanted to cover there. Yeah, I'm good with that. Let's close this down and we'll move on to coroutines finally. Finally, github.com. And by the way, for those of you joining at home and you want to play the home game with us, uh, let's code Kotlin. Here's the code for your own edification. And get clone this one. Let's code Kotlin. And I'm going to move uh, downloads Kotlin to um, inventions and properties. Okay, add. Two conventions, delegates, properties. Get push. Okay, fantastic. So we'll get rid of that. Oops, don't want to get rid of the uh, containing thing. Good. CD desktop. in production. Oh, that's the uh, code from yesterday, I suppose that would be. That's the thing we just updated. OK, we, we had that laying around at all times anyway. Good. So now, let's move the coroutine. So close that out, that re reset. And uh, we're going to build an application now using coroutines, which is fine. Um, Marcus, oh, I, uh, observable does look similar to React. I mean, it looks like a property binding mechanism, which is imminently useful for uh, user interface programming. But as I don't do that a lot, um, I'm sort of rusty, you know. But it, did, but it does kind of seem imminently useful, right? You can do things like, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, form validation and, and form binding, that kind of stuff. <sighs> okay, only only bit that was nasty with it was remembering to do things on the correct thread. Otherwise, you ended up with a terrible user experience. You can have too much of a good thing. Yeah, yeah. It, it, between delegation and properties and coroutines and, you know, uh, DSLs and all that, I can totally see how you'd code yourself into a situation where you're not even sure where you're making the change. You know, um, that seems plausible. Yeah. 
Okay, so today, now, coroutines. Let's, let's get back to coroutines. We looked at the basics, and I and then I, we looked at Spring Boot yesterday, and we looked at how Spring Boot lets you paint over existing APIs. Uh, if you're using Kotlin, uh, you can paint over them and add Kotlin-esque idiomatic uh, extension methods uh, or functions. Actually, that's another thing. You'll hear me say methods just because I've got, you know, more than 20 years of uh, Java experience, and I've just been using Java a long time. Um, but uh, in the Kotlin world, they call what we call a method in the Java community. In the, in, the, in the Kotlin world, we say that a function that's inside of a class is called a member function. And if it's outside of a class, it's just called a function. So there are no methods. What we would, what we in the Java community might call a, a method, we call a member function in, in Kotlin. But I suppose, certainly for me at least, if you said method in the context of a Kotlin program, I would know exactly to what you're referring. So I wouldn't worry. Um, okay, so we're gonna build a, a, we looked at how Spring Boot and Kotlin play well together. Uh, they, you know, we looked at the functional beans DSL for bu building uh, applications using uh, Spring Boot. We saw how that DSL just makes it a lot more, uh, you know, convenient to um, to wire together your applications. We also then looked at uh, the exposed ORM framework, and uh, and so basically, I hope you've got a sense that Kotlin plays well with Spring, but it also brings its own nice toys that you can use that make it uh, just that much more compelling. You can use it to solve business problems that go beyond, you know, what you could do in just Java proper. Um, I keep on hinting at coroutines. And one of the big use cases for coroutines is um, making reactive programming that much more palatable. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so we're gonna use H2. We're gonna use the reactive web support. We use R2DBC. Uh, we use, um, I guess that's it. We wanna use Gradle and Kotlin. We use Kotlin here. So we're gonna say uh, reactive, okay, OOP full reactive. So reactive web, RPDBC, H2, seems good to me. All right. And let me shut down IntelliJ just to make sure it gets a chance to cycle memory. Okay, open that up. It's only 9.30. Do I need another cup of coffee already? Maybe, maybe, oh, okay. I think we're getting close to a point where we can wrap up this discussion of Kotlin, by the way. I'm like, it is a huge ecosystem, so there's no way we can purport to understand everything. Um, but insofar as you need it to, Will we use our 2 dbc template or going on method naming weird conventions? I'm not even sure I understand, friend. I have no doubt that you're asking a reasonable question. I just don't know what it is. Well, I don't, so there's not, uh, there's no r 2 dbc template, right? There's a, uh, is there, has that changed? That could have changed. Entity template. No. Uh, maybe. I'm not planning on covering it. That was, yeah. Okay. Let's just talk about the repositories for now. So you know, you know, there. Um, there's a new. There's a R2BC template now. That's interesting. That's new to me. R2DBC. I know. Let me see. Entity, yeah, empty template, that's different, right? But yeah, I didn't know about, okay, so I'm gonna use the repository support, which, um, yeah, I don't, whatever, either one is fine. Like, a, yeah, this is, we're not doing a, a reactive tutorial this time. Uh, we're doing a, <laughs> you're, you're cheating with your, <laughs> no problem, buddy. Um, okay, so, We'll cover reactive in a, in a different stream. We totally should actually, that's just, but again, we're gonna get to spring integration first because I love your chatting with your phone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, 
and here's the thing that I love about this chat, which is most of you speak other languages, right? Every morning I say good morning to you, wonderful, wonderful group of people and, uh, and or, you know, your evening, afternoon, whatever. And you, you sign in from all around this beautiful world of ours uh, and uh, you, you, you join me in this chat. And uh, the fact that you mostly speak better English than I do, uh, even though it's probably statistically not your first language, just, oh, <laughs> so I, I appreciate everything you're all doing. So, um, yeah, good stuff. Um, so we're not going to spend too long on Reactive. Again, that's not the goal here. We're gonna, what you need to know about Reactive is that it's a, a way to write code in such a way that uh, when there is a chance to free up a thread, it gets done. And the way you do that is by writing code uh, that... Um, works in terms of like prompt, basically something like a promise. Basically you're, you have an abstraction, you have a Java API that lets you uh, bow out and free up the thread whenever you know you don't need the thread. When does this come, in, uh, come into play most often? Well, uh, one major source of that is with input and output, right, IO. And so, so you can use NIO, Java NIO. And um, NIO is, how people get hemorrhoids, right? Java NIO is a, is a, a living nightmare. It's what, it's one of the reasons people have um, very bad, uh, a very bad taste of writing NIO code in Java is the Java NIO libraries are, they're fit for purpose, but they're painful. They're so painful in fact that eventually uh, um, uh, a gentleman named Tristan Lee, you know, almost 20 years ago, created a library called Netty, N-E-T-T-Y. And Netty uh, is just, it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the abstraction that should have been in the JDK, right? Uh, for working with NIO. And, um, but even that is still complicated, right? I don't think most people would readily identify themselves as a Netty programmer uh, in the same way that most of us don't work with uh, IO all that often, right? Our world is often in, is often in terms of our business logic. Right? The higher level types in our system, the things that we use to uh, work with our domain models. So I, you saw me using carts and line items and customers and all that. I haven't given a care to the bytes and, and the way those bytes get conducted over the wire in, in this whole discussion because it's just not that interesting. <sighs> so knowing that we want to take advantage of NIO, but also knowing that NIO requires you to invert the way you think instead of... Um, instead of pulling data from a database, uh, the database pushes the data to you when and only when the data is ready. So you have to rewrite, you have to write your code in a different way such that in effect, you're getting a callback. You're being, your code gets involved when something else tells it to get involved as opposed to uh, at your sort of on your timeline, right? And by rewriting your code in that sort of inverted fashion to work with push instead of pull, um, the runtime now has the flexibility of freeing up the thread when when there's nothing to be pushed, right? When there's nothing uh, for you to do. So it can move your, it can take the selector that's assigned with that NIO operation. It can say, okay, I'm waiting for something to happen. If there's nothing to, ha if there's nothing on the wire, if there are no bytes, then there's no reason to call your code and involve the, involve it in the processing. And if there's nothing for you to do on any thread, then it can give that thread back to the thread pool and let something else that needs it use it. So that's a very gross simplification of what reactive programming is doing. But the result, one of the results uh, is that you get this ability to write code that is much, much more scalable, okay? But like I said, it is a little, it, it's a paradigm shift. Yeah, it doesn't look and feel like regular blocking uh, uh, input streams and output streams. It feels like the evolution of Spring beyond the container, inversion all the way down. Heck yeah, that feels right. I like that. Let's, let's call it that. And by the way, that, there's also, you know, the inversion of control. We call it the IOC container. Um, is everywhere in Spring, right? Uh, it's it, the inversion of control. You, when you talk about injecting dependencies into your class, that's an inversion of control. That's the Hollywood principle. When you talk about uh, messaging with Spring integration, where you write message listeners uh, that get invoked when there's a new message to process, that's inversion of control. Um, 
when you uh, write a method that gets invoked when there's a new HTTP request, that's inversion of control. Because in, the, in all these cases, you're not in control of the life cycle or the timeline uh, uh, of the resources at play here. I don't have to stand up the web server. I just write code that gets involved only when I have to process a, an already parsed, packaged, and uh, uh, routed HTTP request, right? I focus on the thing that matters, and the framework does everything else for me. And so you're right, Inver asynchronous, non-blocking I.O. and reactive programming do feel a bit like that. I'm, I'm only being involved when I need to be involved, and otherwise, the runtime is free to more intelligently route uh, and reuse and repurpose my resources, things like threads. Um, so the programming paradigm is, I don't, I, I have no problem with it, right? I don't understand people who say uh, uh, it's miserable. And I, I understand that it's it's not the same as Java IO. Um, and, I, and I grant you, there's always gonna be a learning curve with any new sufficiently interesting thing. Uh, so it did take me a little while to get to the point where now I feel like I can make anything work in Reactive, or at least I, I'd have a rough idea of where I would start, right? Um, but there's a lot of people that say, no, I don't want to. I'd rather just not have the scale, scalability benefits. And to those, they say, that's fine. You know, just, you can, I don't care. I mean, just do whatever you want, right? There's three benefits to reactive programming. One is um, scalability. The other one is you get a, a, an abstraction that is uh, better to design to give you knobs and levers to control the robustness of your software. So for example, what happens when there's too much data on the wire, right? We think about back pressure uh, or, um, can someone answer the advantage of using Kotlin instead of Java in chat? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I don't know. Like, if you're, using, if you're using Android, one big benefit is that you can write code that looks like Java 25 and it can compile down to Java 8. If you're using uh, Spring, one big benefit is that it has very, very nice support uh, for coroutines, which is, um, uh, which is what we're gonna look at right now. And coroutines can be a very nice alternative to reactive programming. Uh, or actually it's a supplement to reactive programming. It makes the code that much more approachable. So you get a win-win. You get code that looks imperative, but uh, it is uh, actually non-blocking and reactive. So there's just a lot of like, little niceties. And um, the nice thing is that it doesn't have to be an either or. You don't have to eat the whole elephant. You can use Kotlin alongside piecemeal with uh, uh, Java code. So, okay, so let's just, let's just see all that in action, all that setup done. Let's just create a application, uh, data class customer, um, val id int val name string. Okay, this is going to be a Spring Data R2DBC entity. Okay, so I've got R2DBC, which is the Reactive Relational Database Activity uh, Abstraction. Uh, do I? Want... I don't know. So no. It... Reactive helps you with threads, right? With uh, with um, reactive programming helps you write code that does the right thing with threads. But R2DBC itself is like JDBC written using reactive APIs. Okay, so it's a reactive database connectivity abstraction. It it's just gonna if you want to do database I/O and as long as your driver, as long as the R2DBC driver is written using non-blocking code then your apps will be able to do a lot more um, with, with fewer threads. Assuming that, especially assuming you're doing data intense or IO intense work, right? If that becomes the case, if, if you're doing lots of stuff where you're reading a lot of data, then you get really big benefits here because well, you know, you, in the gaps between the raindrops, when you're waiting for bytes to arrive, that thread is not stuck in that holding position waiting for something new, right? It gets put back in the uh, in the pool for somebody else to repurpose it. <sighs> okay, so data class. Interface. Okay, customer repository. Reactive. CRUD repository, customer, int. And what else do we want? Um, that's my data class. I guess that can go up there. We want a component 
class initializer. Good. All right. So we're going to inject private val repo customer repository. Okay. And we'll say repo. Now, here already, let's talk about that, right? Um, I've got a repository. Let's do, let's create an HTTP endpoint. It's a little bit easier to kind of see it in action. Because remember, in order to use coroutines, you need to have a top level context. That context is you have to start it and then dismantle it when you're done with all your coroutine stuff. And Spring will do that for you. So uh, we'll just use Spring to do that. Uh, remember, I said you can create beans here. So I can say add initializer beans. Right? Okay. Bean. And you can define a bean there. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a coroutine router. So you might know that there's a DSL for re you know the functional reactive um, HTTP endpoints, right? I don't, I don't know if you've seen this before. This is very convenient, right? So I can say customers, and then I can say server response dot ok dot body, and the body I want to get from the repository now repo equals ref customer repository. Okay, val uh, customers. But find all. Okay, so I'm going to get a reactive stream of values, and I want to return that there. Okay, so there you go. There's my. Uh, well, this is not. We're we're not using um, reactive. We're not using coroutines yet. Okay, this is the reactive way. Okay, so I'm creating a functional reactive uh, Spring application. You don't have to do this. You could create a controller, right? But let's just keep it here so we can focus on this part, right? I've created, I'm using a router here. This router is establishing that I have Spring NVC or Spring HTTP endpoints, right? Don't be, sorry. don't worry, buddy. I'm just, don't, like, I'm glad you know where we're going, but the rest of us need like piecemeal. Um, okay, so let's just run this. And actually, I need data, don't I? I can't, even I get ahead of myself sometimes. So we're going to go here. Uh, new file data.sql, create table. Customer, oh, this is supposed to be in schema. Oh, well, whatever. Serial primary key, uh, our car two five five, not null. Okay, and not that SQL. Okay, insert into customer name values. <sighs> <clears throat> okay, uh, let's see, and this is called schema, and then we want uh, Marcus, and then we want Ahmed, and we want uh, uh, Igor, and whatever, there are some names, okay? So we'll restart the application. Um, there we go. Goody. Okay, so now local host customers. Okay, okay, great. So we have our reactive HTTP endpoint and everything is fine, right? Not that big a deal, but it worked. And yes, I could have also written this using a controller, right? There's nothing stopping me from doing that. So I can say at, response, uh, at rest controller, for example, class customer HTTP controller. And uh, I need the constructor to have a pointer to my repository. So private val repo customer repository mapping customers. All right, fun customers equals this dot repo dot find all. Right, and that works fine too. So if I get rid of all this. Right. Let me see if that'll work. I don't know if I can 
have a, a router that doesn't have an endpoint, but we'll try. No, uh, let's see here. So I'll just get rid of all that for a moment. Okay, same exact result, yeah? Okay, the problem with this is I'm using reactive APIs. And so as soon as I wanna do something interesting with this data, I need to start thinking about it in terms of reactive programming. So I wanna, I'm using here the return value of find all is a publisher, a reactive publisher, okay? Okay, fine, so if I wanna map data, I have to map it, uh, that's no problem. I have a, I can say whatever, it dot ID. So now I have a, a reactive stream of IDs, right? Um, and so this type is a publisher of int now, right? Int. <laughs> so there's um, a customer of uh, a, a reactive stream of it, and which is fine. But again, what if I want to just pass this to something that doesn't speak reactive programming, right? I'm going to feel uh, I can do something horrible like this, right? Where I block, and you know that kind of works. I guess I could. Uh, I could. There's there are ways to get this to a stream, uh, and then then you can turn that into a list, and uh, you know. It's not great. It's not natural to work like this. So remove this though, so we can kind of see what's happening. Um, Bean has to be in a class. Yeah, it has to be in a configuration class. That's the important part. Actually, it has to be in a Spring component. So technically, you could put at Bean inside of like at service, you know, uh, it's just that it, the configuration is designed to work with beans and that's where you get the uh, smart, you know, when you call the same method, if you do method injection, if you call another method to get a reference to a bean and you call it 10 times, you want the same memoized version that only works inside of a configuration class, right? So if you call the method 10 times on a bean method inside of like add component class, then you'll get the same, you'll get the new value 10 different times, which is, wasteful, right? So I would definitely put it in a configuration class. But anyway, the answer is probably not. You can't, you can't apply it to a top level um, function. Okay, so back to here. Okay. Router. Uh, did I already? All right, very good. So, good. So now I've got this uh, reactive pipeline. Um, body, what is the issue here, friends? I want this to be customers, please. No, no, no. Good. Okay, so good. Okay, so we've got this reactive pipeline. I want to be able to use coroutines, and uh, let's just see what happens. First of all, you you change the outer context to use the coroutine router, the co router. Okay. Next, there are extension functions for all these reactive types. Okay. So in this case, I'm just returning all the data. Right, so I can actually turn it to a flow, right? Flow, and a flow is a type in the in the coroutine world um, that you can use that is looks kind of like a flux. So I would say here for collections, what we would think of as collections for streams, for iterables, or whatever, this is kind of like a like for like, you know, uh, exchange. Right, you don't really gain a lot. There are extension functions here uh, that you can use for awaiting, right, which is the, uh, you know, it's the await part of like async await. When you have a suspendable function, you can await it, right? So here we're awaiting the values of the flow. I don't think this is particularly great. It's not like you've gained a lot here, but where it really kind of like becomes clear to me that you've gained something is when you start doing single values, right? So I've got customers ID 
and um, uh, val customer by ID. Uh, I want this to be a customer. I don't want a mono or a future or whatever. I just want a customer piece. So customer repo. So repo dot find by ID. This returns a value. Let me get the ID. The val ID equals uh, it dot path variables. Right, and I want this to be a um, what does this return? This returns a string by default. So I will do integer int. Okay, pass that in. And what this gives me is a mono by default. See, mono of this. So this doesn't compile. If I want it to compile, though, I can use code. I can say I want to await. Okay. Um, they get rid of all these, that's kind of interesting, await single, right? So here I'm saying, I'm expecting a single value, it's not nullable, or it could be nullable, like an optional, right? Uh, so single or null or single. So I'm gonna say await single, please. There we go. That gives me now, um, the, the compiler is sad because I haven't returned a server response. So let's just do that quickly. Return by ID. Body uh, value and await. Okay, so customer ID. What I what I have here is await single. This is going to this is an extension function on mono and flux. It'll return t, not a wrapper around t. I actually have t here. So now on the next line, in the very in very imperative style, I can say. The customer ID is customer dot ID and, and the name is name, right? I don't have to like chain it together. There's no wrapping. There's no like, uh, you know, uh, then or like in promises in JavaScript, there's no, um, uh, you know, subscribe like in reactive uh, uh, APIs. It's just, I have the type, but I'm not blocking. Okay, that's the important thing here. Um, it's a shame that reified types don't support the optional part of the type, giving you a weight single and a weight single or null. I'm afraid I don't understand what you're saying, but it sounds true. So I'm gonna, I don't know. I don't, I don't quite understand. Um, okay, so, uh, I have this now value. And the, the nice thing about this is it might actually be that the thread on which this code executes is different from the thread on which this executes, right? And, and the reason is because when I do it, when I await something, Kotlin is that the compiler is actually currying. It's all, it's taking all the stuff that happens after this and kind of like putting it in a callback for us, right? I don't know if we're going to see it, but in theory, you could. So uh, let's see here. We have to print line thread dot current thread dot name. Okay, put that down there. Let's run this again. Okay. ID. So we have customers one. Yeah, well, it's the same in this case. Not being able to say customer equals find by ID await single. Oh, why can't? Well, oh, you're saying you want this to just do the right thing based on whether your variable is null or not? as opposed to the user having to say await single or null, right? And this would be that. I think that's a, you're saying it's just annoying that we have to do both of those things manually when the type system already understands that. Oh, yes, okay, okay, I'm with you, that sucks. You're right, it would be nice. But this isn't a limitation in Spring, it's just, there's only so much magic 
the Kotlin compiler team can do. Um, okay. Well, anyway, that's the that's coroutines right there. I don't know. I, this change this just blew my mind. The idea that I can write this code and it's still not going to block. It's still not going to keep that thread in limbo. Like if this if this find operation took like a minute, it doesn't matter. This thread is still going to it's going to be freed up. And when this data is available, only then does this get executed. They revive the thread later on, right? Um, um, just amazing. So I get the best of both worlds. I can write code in terms of like this imperative style. I can debug this now. Well, you know, there's still a lot of threading happening behind, behind the scenes, but I could debug it. I can easily say, okay, I want to put a breakpoint right here. And when I get to that point, I'll have customer data by ID and name. I'll have that uh, uh, available for, for inspection, right? That's the power of coroutines here. And the trick is just to remember to set up your co-writer. Now I'm using this co-writer. Let's, let's now go to a controller, okay? So at rest controller, customer HTTP controller. Here, it, you can also use it, but you have to make sure you make the method a suspending function, okay? And actually this is quite nice if you want the type safety. So suspend fun customers by ID path variable uh, ID int int and uh, I want to return a single customer okay <clears throat> so I'll inject the repository there private val uh, repo Okay, so I'll say uh, uh, val customer equals this dot repo dot find by ID ID await single. Okay, and I can just return customer and print out the results. The ID is. <clears throat> Good. Let's rerun this. Uh, I think I'm running it as opposed to debugging it. There we go. We have access to the customer ID one name equals call it etc. Right, uh, and I can. I can debug it. I have all this like convenient uh, support there, but I don't have to worry about on. I don't have to worry about making this the the threading because I'm using reactive APIs and because all reactive APIs can be treated with coroutines. I now get non-blocking I/O while still being able to think about my data in the same way as I would for you know imperative blocking I/O. It's, it's just magic. I, that 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 part just blows my mind. Right? You're, you've got. You still have to understand reactive programming. I'm not saying that reactive programming is completely gone. It's still there. You still need to understand basically what's happening. But for the most part, things get a lot simpler by doing this, right? I just, it just blows my mind. So much, so much nicer. And, um, you know, there's like, there's all these opportunities now to use reactive API. So you can do Kafka. You can do, I wonder if you could do that. Is that, could you do that? How would you do that? Could I await a new message? You probably could. You could probably use Spring uh, integration. I mean, there's just some amazing possibilities there. You can actually write coroutines and like, you could write in theory, you can use the reactive support for um, messages um, in Spring integration and like await a stream of messages. You want to try that? Let's try that. Because you know, did you know you can return a publisher from Spring Innovation? But you would get a flow, right? So Spring Innovation, we're going to try something. Okay, so this is like, this concludes our um, well understood portion of the show. Okay. From here on, 
down for the next whatever half hour, we're in uh, uh, no nerds territory, right? Where I haven't tried this before. Could be fine. Could work. I don't know. But basically, it just occurred to me, in Spring Integration, you can return a publisher instead of an integration flow, right? And this publisher is a reactive stream type. And since you can do that, that means that you could await the publisher. But you'd only get a flow. Um, hmm. How would that work? Can I? I don't know. It would be kind of it would be very weird. You'd be setting up a spring integration pipeline for one value. And then in that case, it could work. Um, well, yeah, learn just enough reactive programming to basically understand it and then use coroutines. Like, I, um, yeah, spring integration is awesome. We'll, this is, like I said, I think we should actually do that series next. I, I think when we wrap up this Kotlin series, and this might be it. I think we're kind of in a place where I feel like I could point most people to one of these episodes and say, okay, in order to understand everything else we're doing for the next year or whatever, come back and watch these episodes and you'll probably get the answer. I don't think there's anything huge. I mean, we didn't do Kotlin native, we didn't do Android programming, but that's not, you know, that's not hard to understand conceptually if you understand the syntax here. Uh, you wanna get into reactive, pro yes, absolutely. Um, but again, use reactive programming if you are if you can as a way to get uh, to to coroutines and uh, and then Project Loom as well, right? Project Loom. So you know, in general, you want to write your server side code in such a way that if it's not taking advantage of reactive programming, it's taking advantage of Loom uh, and and or coroutines. You know. Um, yeah, great question. Where can you find that pub pub sub Postgres example? Thank you for asking. For those of you uh, just joining, you should please remember to like and subscribe. So. Let's see, where is that example? This one. This video was one of my first videos on this new channel when I, when I launched this channel. Uh, and it's from a month ago. So I'll paste this in the chat and uh, paste that there. Okay, so there's the video. Check that out. Not now, later. It's, six, it's a six minute watch. It's inspired by a fiendishly, deviously smart uh, example um, from our friend Raphael Winterhalter, who's a, he, he created Bike Buddy. He's, he's amazing. He's a fellow Java champion, just amazing. And he wrote a, a blog in the Java advent calendar, you know, last in December. Um, uh, hi, Syed. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks for joining us. Uh, he wrote a, a gr brilliant blog. Um, and, uh, I, and it's on spring innovation. I love spring innovation. Like I said, I've, I've done a whole bunch of, uh, uh, I've committed a lot of terrible code that has since been fixed. And by the way, we had um, Oleg Zorkuski. And we actually, we just yeah, there's been a lot of great Spring Integration content. I just haven't done a Let's Code on Spring Integration. So <clears throat> I had uh, Oleg, and then we had Glenn. So watch both of those. Those are both really deep. This guy only got 202. What? What are we, what are we doing, you people? You, please watch. This guy's great. Like he's, he's amazing. He's funny as hell. He, uh, yeah. This is one of my all-time favorite human beings. Uh, both. I mean, all the all the people I have in my show. I just I would hang out at a bar for hours with any of them. Right. That's. That, I mean, they're they're awesome people. I'd let them into my home and let them spend the night. They're all like people that I I just uh, I have the utmost respect for. But Oleg, he's he he. he yeah, he's great. Okay, so let's let's try something. Let's try something kind of. I have I just thought about this. I don't know if it'll work. It'll be kind of a little interesting coroutine experiment. So we're gonna say um, integration. Okay. Um, okay. We're gonna use uh, reactive web. We use Kotlin. We use this. Um, we need spring integration, yeah, good. Oh, also, I'm gonna save this up off to our Git repository, okay. Uh, let's see here, so I need that code here. I'm just checking these into a 
folder on the Git repository. Okay, everybody. So if you want to find these examples, there's no particular rhyme or reason, but I feel bad for poor Ahmed who tried so hard to uh, organize my stream of thought Let's Code Spring Boot series. Uh, and uh, I'm sure I was just sorely disappointed. Okay, so um, git clone let's code. Okay, download reactive. We're going to call this reactive web coroutines. CD reactive web rmrf build. Git add this. Git status. Git commit polish. Git push. Okay. Um. Okay. Go back to the desktop. To AO integration.zip. Okay. I'm going to try something. I don't know if it'll work. It might work. It's simple enough. So Spring Integration is an integration technology that you can use to write a event-driven code. And uh, it lets you, it's, a, it's an, a great example of an inversion of control. You tell it where you want to get the data, it, it'll give you the data. You don't have to worry about pulling or scraping or, or queuing or whatever. You just, you just write this code that responds to the eventual message that arrives and the adapter sources the data and uh, it provides it to you when it's available. Okay, that's part one. You can write uh, an integration flow that'll do that for you. Part two is you can turn that integration flow into a reactive stream. So could you use coroutines to await that reactive stream? And I reckon you could, right? Um, so we're gonna try that out. First things first. What does it look like to start up a coroutine context with reactive code? Um, let's see, what's a good example? So we go for a build.gradle. Okay. Uh, we wanna create a application that uses spring integration. And we're gonna use the spring integration File support. Okay. Pretty trivial. Command Shift I. Did that work on this? Yeah, it does. Okay. So Control W. Okay, make sure I close the wrong thing. Good. Command W. So now let's just try the old-fashioned configuration, please. Class integration configuration. Let's just see if we can make this work. So it's a regular spring integration app uh, flow. From, um, and you provide a inbound adapter. So in this case, the inbound adapter is a file inbound adapter. It's going to monitor a directory. Uh, that directory uh, is going to be system property utils dot parse resolve placeholders okay home desktop oh here's an interesting one you have to escape this in Kotlin right because remember dollar sign curly bracket that's actually a spring string strings in Kotlin have uh, templatized parameters right um, and Spring has the property placeholder expression language, and they conflict. So you need to you need to make sure that you escape this value. Otherwise, Kotlin will look for a variable in the local scope uh, uh, called home, and it, it'll it'll fail to compile because it won't find it. I forgot about that. Okay, so um, so there's that. So desktop home in. Okay. And what about this? This is going to be, what does this need to be? 
message source spec. Right. Okay, that's this bit right here. So yeah, okay. <clears throat> so p p dot uh, polar uh, pm pm dot fixed delay sure okay dot um, handle right and this could be a generic handler uh, of object generic handler actually we can use the sam syntax here generic handler of file and the data that I'm going to log out is the file message headers. So the message headers, and I just want to just want to get the data and then turn it into a file name. App absolute path. There you go. That's a string. Okay. So now, what does that give me? That gives me a Integration flow. Okay. So if I run this program, Spring Spring Integration will start up this flow. Oh, by the way, yeah, of course this can. This can live outside there. Oh, very good. So it's going to look for new files in that directory, and every second it'll look for new files. And if it sees a new file, it's going to send a message to this next component in the chain, which is just handle, but you could do anything, right? You could do transform, you could do ma uh, the, the, you could do uh, routes, you could do resequence, you could do split and aggregation and all that kind of stuff. In our case, all we're gonna do is just uh, transform, okay? It's just trivial transform um, and then handle. Do we wanna do, yeah, I guess we can just do, so file, headers, print line, the file is file dot, hmm? uh, uh, direct transformer. Okay. Transform. This is looking for a generic transformer of string a file in and string out. And so we'll say uh, message headers message dot absolute path. That should be it, right? Required type variable, type variable, so it's type mismatch. Let's see. It's just, oh, I need to specify the pipe. And right, yeah, okay. So now it's file headers, file dot absolute path, Java. Generic transformer file string. Now there's there is even a Kotlin DSL, so this should be even easier. But for now, sticking with the Java one, which might be to my detriment here. Remove okay. Type variable type mismatch found file any to string. Okay, so what's the issue here? That seems happy. Why is it not happy? Why is it not obviously happy? Okay, so this is expected one parameter of type file. Fine. Oh, God, that was so painful. Okay. And then this can hang outside. Fine. Great. OK. 
Okay, moving on. So transform dot handle. And then here, uh, do I still get the file and the headers or do I not? Let's just find out. Print line got the file. Final dot. Okay, I guess I don't have the uh, headers. Good. All right, that's fine. Um, and uh, we can then get the result of that, which is dot git. Start that. Okay, so now cd desktop cd in, you know, touch random. There you go. Okay, so you can see <clears throat> I've got this integration flow and I called dot git and that creates a, that registers a bean of type integration flow in the Spring application context. That, okay, but what if I don't call git? What if I call to publisher? To reactive publisher. I can say auto start on on uh, sub subscribe. Um, auto start on subscribe. And so this is a publisher of string names. And this goes away. So, so. Oh, the message. Okay, so I get a message. Spring integration message. There we go. Good. Okay, so now we've got a reactive stream with Spring integration. So whenever there's a new file, we'll get a new message in this reactive stream. It's pretty interesting in of itself. Now the question is, can we await that? Um, and so the auto subscribe on, the auto start on subscribe, should it, wait, what is that gonna do? Does it kick off the pipeline when the application starts up? Let's make sure I understand what that's doing. I always forget. So start message production and consumption in the flow when a subscription to the publisher is initiated. If this is set to true, the flow is marked to not start automatically by the application context. That's what I wanted. Um, so let's instead set this to true because we don't want to start this pipeline until something is subscribed to it reactively. And in this case, what we're hoping will, will be the case is that we can subscribe to it using coroutines, okay? So, um, Okay, another bean, and uh, actually we don't even need that, do we? We can just do post construct fun init yes <clears throat> val uh, publisher equals this dot flow dot oh, as flow. So do I need to like? Can I do that? Can I just do suspend fun and have that do the right thing? I don't know. So what I've got now is a flow, not a reactive stream. So in theory, I could just do a, it's a for each now, right? Uh, or is it each? Oh, they changed it. It's, it's no longer for each. There's a new method called something completely useless. I remember this. Collect. Oh, come on. Flow for each is whatever it is expecting. What is this collect? Okay, so collect is the new for each, which is the new subscribe. Okay, so first of all, got a new value. It, all right, let's just try that. Life cycle, oh, it's a, no arguments. So it doesn't work as a co as a coroutine. So I have to just start the 
context myself. I suppose this will work. I don't know. And run blocking is no longer in this. Be fine, yeah, it should be fine. Okay, it's circular, that's fair. So we create a bean here bean of listener uh, runner equals application runner uh, to have a dependency on well, nothing really. So we'll just put that logic here that. Get rid of this. Okay. So this will get run when the application is ready. So I have, there's no reason I couldn't call that because that's being delayed until after the application is ready to run. Cool. Okay, so I've got a new value, generic message. Let's see if it keeps working. It keeps working. Okay. So I can, that's, that's interesting in of itself. Uh, After file absolute path here, why do you directly use dot after the bracket without closing parentheses? This right here? I'm not sure I understand your question, friend. Um, this is a lambda. And in Kotlin, lambdas can live outside the parentheses or inside if they're the last parameter. In this case, I just chose to keep it outside because it's just natural. Okay. Um, so, okay, this works fine as a flow. What if I want to await a single value? Now, of course, in this case, I have a reactive, I have a stream. Yeah. So, await a single message of. And I'll say this is a string. So, um, and actually, I can, I can do this. So, map. Uh, what does this give me? This gives me a publisher of message. So, I should be able to. Uh, to flux. Map. That's the issue. A reactive publisher of type message of string. To mono dot map, uh, and then it's a a it dot payload, which is just the payload is yeah okay so two mono it dot payload found what is payload. This should be okay. Required mono out of string, which is fine. That's what I have. And then this is a this is mono out change lambda expression to. Sure. Yeah, okay. It doesn't need to be there. Okay, so what I've got now is a reactive stream. And when some when I inject that stream, I can subscribe to it by awaiting it as a so what I should get is just one file name. This is this should be of type string, right? By using coroutines here. 
cool. Okay, so now, um, this will blow up if I have more than one message, by the way. Uh, I just wanted to see if we could do it as an experiment. Um, did we get a message? Publisher. Uh, uh, new file name, okay? I'm gonna delete the data here. Restart. Okay. Okay, nothing there. Oh, that's a bit of a bummer. That did not work. <sighs> well, that's sad. Let me think about that. Why would that be the case? So what if I just go back to this? And then I have a publisher of message of string. Okay, so publisher message of string. Okay, fair enough. And now this is not a waitable. I have a, oh, this is a message of string. Fair. But does that work? Let's see if that works. Hmm. Oh, maybe I need to, okay, I want this to auto start. It's interesting. Huh. Well, that didn't work as I was hoping it would. That's a bit of a bummer. What I was hoping to, well, wait, fail to send me. So it looks like the, the flow, the coroutine isn't signaling pull. It's not signaling that it wants to get the data. So when I subscribe, oh, okay. So if I do this, it, this is what caused that most recent issue. It started before we were able to run this. It started to subscribe before there was something to consume the data. Okay, so what if I got rid of that? We started. Okay, so now it's up and running. Nothing has expressed, nothing is subscribing to the publisher yet. We've got a bean of type publisher message of string, but nothing is subscribing to that, okay? I would expect that this would have the effect of subscribing and that should trigger the, the uh, poll. So, yeah, that's, that's bizarre. So is this not running? It's not even running. Like this doesn't, it looks like this doesn't ever run. Hmm. That's a bit of a bummer. I could try this in an endpoint. We could try that and see if that like works. So bean fun endpoints or you know routes uh, equals co router get uh, file. You know the one file and here, I can try that. And we say server response dot okay dot body and await, body value and await, new file name. Okay. Maybe that'll create the uh, subscription. Okay, so now we're not expecting it to start until we're here, localhost, file. 
file. Is that what we call the endpoint? Yeah. And not see the existing file. So if I add, yeah. Well, that's a bit of a problem. I don't know what is happening there. There's a interaction I'm not quite understanding between spring integration and coroutines, which I didn't. I, w I wasn't sure if that was going to work anyway. It's just kind of nice to nice to think it could work though. That that is super cool. All right, my friends. Well, whatever. Well, I'll I'll dig into this, but I think tomorrow we'll start digging into spring integration or something else. But either way, I think we're at a good place in our Kotlin journey. Um, this has been eye-opening. I haven't played with Kotlin in months. Certainly not since Spring Boot 3.0. Um, what else do you need to know? I don't know. If you think of something else we need to be talking about uh, and uh, that, that would otherwise delay us moving on to something else, let me know. I would love to know. We could, we could cover that. Uh, otherwise, I think we're in a good place. I appreciate your time. It's been fun. I'm going to go make another cup of coffee and work on the next video. So I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, everybody.